Hello, welcome to the All or Not podcast. Our official sponsors are KR Couriers and Transport Limited. This is a Northwest based courier company delivering all across the UK. They can assist in home moves and removals to large, heavy, and bulky items, collections, and drop offs. Fast, safe, and reliable deliveries. Please get in touch for a free quote. You'll find all the information within the description. Thank you. Hello everybody, welcome to the All or Nothing podcast with Billy Moore. Tonight I'm celebrating five years clean and recovery, so I've reached a milestone on my journey and I wanted to share a little bit of my experience. Five years ago, my life was an absolute nightmare. I was totally destroyed. I was living in a house that I couldn't pay for. The landlord was on my case. He'd have the police at my house regular or his house. I'd lost my job. I couldn't maintain any relationships with family or friends. So I started to isolate myself. I'd been given a lump sum of money from the producer of this movie, A Prayer Before Dawn. You know, they put £18,000 in me my, in my bank. And, you know, I know it's not life changing money, but it was enough to fund the habit. You know, and I used on my own for, for, for a good, for a good bit of that and I'm sitting in this sitting in this room you know with the curtains closed with a table full of all them drugs that I wanted they were just there everything I wanted was in front of me and I just broke down sobbing and I knew why I, I knew that I had everything in front of me that I wanted but there was nothing there that I needed you know, I needed my family, I needed my friends. I wanted to be a normal, productive member of society again. I used the cancer diagnosis as an excuse to relapse. I'd had four years, eight months under my belt before I picked up. So my journey hasn't always been straight. It's been a struggle ever since I came back from, from Thailand. You know, I was... I was... Fighting just to to get a day clean sometimes, and then I get four years, eight months, and a relapse because of cancer. I don't. I say because of cancer. I used obviously, you know, that contributed to to the relapse. But I believe I could have got through that with the help of friends if I just reached out and asked for it. But instead, I, I chose drugs to bury all the fears that I was feeling. And I didn't want to cope with life on life's terms and face reality. So I'd escape into an abyss of, of drugs and, and I'd be in a narcotic stupor for most of, you know, my chemo sessions. I don't know how I managed to get to the, the hospital and have the chemo put in me. You know, I'd sit there for eight hours a day with sunglasses on and a cap because all my hair had fell out. I remember getting a shower one day and I was pulling clumps of, of air out and you know I had to wear a cap and I was looking like a screaming skull so that affected my image. I had family members really really concerned coming to the house and knocking at the door and I'd blanked them. Just ignored them. I felt embarrassed, I felt ashamed and all I wanted to do was just continue to use and destroy myself go out with a bang. You know, before one of the on one of the um before I took the chemo, the oncologist asked me would you know, I'd like to freeze my sperm in case, you know, in the future I wanted kids. <laughs> I just looked at and fucking having a laugh, mate. I'm on all kinds of drugs here. Can't even get an ad on. You know, having kids now at this, you know, part of my life, this stage of my life is, is not going to happen. You know, I've been with girls in the past and I always wanted children, I always wanted a family, I wanted to settle down. And 
a few of the girls that be in with it become pregnant and terminated the pregnancy. So I lost all hope. I'd been, I tell you now, I'd been with three women. And I remember every one of them, you know, who'd got pregnant and terminated the pregnancy. Every single one of them had terminated the pregnancy. And, I, you know, it broke me. It really did. It ruined me. I lost all hope and faith in in any kind of relationship with, with any anyone. So kids were off off the cards. You know, so I said, no, just carried on using. You know, but it was getting really, really, really desperate. And I remember someone sending me a message and saying to me, Bill, do you want to live or do you want to die? I'd just been to Cannes Film Festival. You know, and I was dressed all smart and this Hugo Boss tuxedo standing on the red carpet, snorting subbies in the toilet, drinking bevies on the sly, not telling the producers or the director or the actor you know, that, that I'm using, keeping it a secret. And I'm standing on the red carpet in this tuxedo on, on a Saturday night with thousands of people cheering and applauding my achievements. Can you imagine that? Cheering and applauding my achievements when the credits rolled up. You know, on a Monday morning, I'm on Breck Road in a crack den in the same tuxedo trying to scrape a tenner together for a pipe. How sad's that? That's the reason I call this podcast the all or nothing because it was all or nothing. I was extreme. You know, and, um, this message came through. Billy, do you want those those credits to roll at the end of the movie and say, you know, this movie was dedicated to Billy Moore, who sadly passed away from drug addiction. Or do you want us to say that this movie, you know, is an inspirational journey of one man's recovery? It's your choice. You know, and, and, and it made me think, and I was doing things in the end that I didn't want to do. And I was going to places that I didn't want to go. I was paranoid. You know, I was using some of the money I had to to buy spy gadgets from eBay. I was getting night vision goggles. <laughs> bizarre. Smoking crack. We had a night vision goggles sitting in the park in Walton, looking up and down the road. Like, sure, someone's talking about me or following me. I bought listening devices. <laughs> right, I'm listening at walls. Someone's talking about me four doors, four doors away. <laughs> it was mad. I had a watch with a camera on it, so I'd be like, it was fucking paranoid. It was weird. It was just odd. It was just odd where my head, my mind, it just really, like, fractured my mind. And I had to kind of, like, make a decision whether I wanted to live or die. And that was the question. Do you want to live, Bill, or do you want to die? And I reached out and I spoke to the producers and they explained my situation. And they put a care package together and I was sent off to a rehab up in Essex and, and I got my first day clean on the 23rd of September 2017 and they haven't used since. And while I was in there, I think I was about six weeks clean, just under. And my mum, you know, spoke to me on the phone and said that the police have been to the air house looking for me, and they wanted to, they wanted to wait with me, and I knew what they wanted, and I went, I went home, got arrested by the police, got a charge sheet, and I'm standing in Liverpool Crown Court. Five months clean, right? So I've, I've got this desire to live now. I'm five months clean. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, this judge is going to show some compassion. So show some compassion here. 
you know, I've, there's loads of contributing factors what led up to me, me relapse and, you know, there's got to be some understanding. I've been 10 years out of the prison system. I've been a benefit to the community. I've been working for the NHS. I've been doing all the right things. I've built a life up and then I've been hit hard with a cancer diagnosis and I've had, you know, this brief period that's engulfed me of using and I've just destroyed everything around me, lost everything within within months. He just looked at me, didn't even acknowledge the letter. You know, just I wrote a, a pulse of prize when the letter about how I felt. You know, it's in my second book. You know, I wrote the letter and put the, the letter that I wrote to the judge. You know, and I took responsibility, you know, I was accountable for my behaviour. Uh, you know, I've done something wrong, I'm gonna deserve to to get a consequence, but I didn't expect to get sentenced to two and a half years clean. It wasn't gonna save any papers, so I go to prison clean which was new to me. You know, I put on a brave face when I landed in reception in Walton. It was a Friday night, chippy night, a fish Friday. You smell the fish when you get to the reception. I've got a little phone that my mates give me, a Zanko, on the way to court. I said, just take that just in case, lad. You know, you never know what's going to happen. So I plugged it. And for those that don't know what plugging means, it's stuck up my ass. And I didn't realise that Walton had changed from when I was there. You know, you go into the reception and then you've got to sit in this, they call it the hot chair, and it beeps you if anything metal is detected in your body. And I've sat down and it's gone, beep! It jumped up like it had been bit on the ass. And one of the Al screws who knew me from years ago looked at me and was shaking his head. He said, oh, you're having to have your lad, you're having to. I went, see, you having what, boss? What is it? He said, sit down again. But this time, I sat right on the edge. How I got away with it, I don't know, but it never went off. And I was like, wow, thank fuck for that. Get, I had no, by the way, I had no charger or credit on the SIM card. It was just, it was just, a de- the phone was, was dead. <laughs> and I got put in with the, um, got put in the cell. And this kid coming called, well, she's saying he was crank. You know, I've met him since. Yeah, it was Chris Crank. What a name. You're in with a crank. And he was an electrician. And he was a nice kid. And he, because he was a spark, he, he got this phone charged. And he ended up getting some credit on it. And he used it to phone my sponsor. I didn't use it for any illegal you know, operations. I was using it to phone friends and family for support because I was terrified that... I've landed in this prison and it was like full of drug induced paranoia. People in there slashing each other left, right, and centre, smashing the pads up, flooding the wings. The noises were horrendous. You know, they were inhuman coming from people's, the bowels of people's guts, screams of a night. I was like, what the, what's going on here? You know? And when I first went to prison, it was Billy, how are you, lad? Then I go a few, la- a few years later, it'd be, What's happening, Uncle Bill? Then I landed this time. It's going, all right, Pops. <laughs> this is not for me no more, this, you know. I'm looking around thinking, I don't want to be. I haven't been to prison for over 10 years. The last time I was in Walton, I was on the roof. You know, um, and, you know, everyone smoked Rocky back then and they were on the swag. You know, no one could even get a bifter in there unless you paid about five ton, you know, for, for an ounce of burn and, Everyone was smoking spice, and I've never, ever took spice. I'm grateful for that. Thank you. Um, never experienced that. There's a few drugs there legalised that I haven't tried, so, you know, I'm an old-school fossil of a of a user. But, yeah, it was horrible. And I started to write about my experience in in there, and, I, and, and it came out that, you know, I, I wrote another book called Fighting For Me Life. You know, when I got out, I went through the system. I went from Walton to, I liked Walton to be fair. You know, I got a cleaner's job, you know, at the gym. I was I was doing all the right things for the first time in my life. You know, every time I'd been to prison, I was down the block in segregation. I was fighting with screws. I was fighting with other inmates. But this time around, you know, I developed a, a little bit of maturity. I looked around. I thought, it's okay, you're clean. Stay clean. Don't use. Use this as a platform to to change your life. 
I was I was with this girl at the time. You know, I was on the phone to her. You know, the relationship was quite toxic, and it ended when I was in there. She she put the phone down on me. She bought me, and it broke my heart. It did, but I'm glad really. But at the time, the painful feelings I was experiencing were driving me to use drugs. It drove me to 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 to, to, to continue and, and stay strong. No, and I'm in a shell with a guy who's um, who's dealing spice and using it himself. And it's like people say, you know, people, places, and things avoid them. Well, you can't really, can you? Not when you're in a shell with them. You know, people, places, and things, dangerous situations. I'm in the shell with them. I can't get out. I can't just knock at the door and go, "Excuse me, sir, can can I can I um can I move cells? I like that cell over there because that one is much much cleaner than this one. And my occupant here, he's a bit of a bit of a crank." It doesn't work like that. You've got to just just shook it up. You know, and I've seen some some mad things there. People were selling the roasties for, for spice. She has to turn up at your door in a pair of beds or boots, open the flap and go, all right, mate, do you want to buy these roasties for a little bit of spice? Like, what the fuck? <laughs> Seriously, you know, it, it, was, it was heavy. Um, so I started to write about it all, and yeah, there again, a book came out, Fighting For Me Life. This is all about the journey that I'm talking about now, but more in depth. You know, I go through the prison system, he ends up getting transferred to Hindley, hated Hindley. Screws with our lashes, all young kids. I was on a wing, you know, the drug free wing. It was There was more drugs on there than he was outside. I set up a meeting of recovery on the wing for those that were struggling. I got the okay from the PO and the SO. Then there was notes going in the box saying I was cultivating gang culture in these meetings because a few people were turning up and they wanted to change their lives. And, you know, I was inspiring them and, and sharing, you know, my experience and going, you know, there's a way out. You don't have to carry on using. You don't have to carry on killing yourself. You don't have to carry on, you know, that old way of living. You know, you can change. And there was hope. And people turned up and they were like, yeah, come on, I want to do this. What do, what do I need to do? I said, just like a day at a time, don't pick up. Seriously, just, just, just don't pick up. And your life, you know, will get better. And people started to get jealous. Notes were flying in the box. I'd get my shell to old. Early hours in the morning, you know, I was under suspicion of selling spice. I was like, you serious? So I was being targeted. And I was put in for a cat D, you know, a cat D is like, you know, it's like an open prison. I'd gone, I'd never been to an open prison in the two decades of being to prison in me. So it was something new. And they'd granted me the cat D, they took it off me because of these notes. I fronted the governor, I said, look, mate, either we're going to stand for something or, or we'll fall for anything. I need, you know, you to believe what I'm saying here. I know. <laughs> I oh, haven't had the uh, the best history with prisons, but I'm telling you the truth. You know, for some reason, he believed me. And I got my cat here, and I went to phone cross. So what? Uh, I'm about... Yeah, I'm about what? I'm almost a year clean now. Stays in phone cross a, a few months, and finishes my book while I'm in there. I want to thank the people in there that helped me as well. Give me the opportunity to sit down and write that. And up on release, I've got nowhere to go. And my mum put me up. She said I was going to be on a tag. So I was a home care for you for three months. So I went to my mum's and she lives in a bungalow. In a two-bedroom bungalow. And I lived in the, in the front room for eight months on a camp bed. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I built this relationship up with my brother Joe. You know, Joe would sit next to me and I never really knew him. He'd always been there. And he was sitting next to me and he'd be talking to me and I'd be on my phone, you know, just scrolling through social media and liking posts. You know, not really paying much attention to him. And he said... Um, he said something and I was 
that game, I was scrolling, and he just got up and walked out. And I looked up and said, where are you going, lad? And he said, you're not listening. And that struck a chord with me. So I put the phones down and said, come here, sit down, please. And he sat down and we had the best conversation ever, you know, and um, it blew me away what his innocence and his... He was just, just a, uh, he was just an absolute beautiful soul. And I thought, wow, my God. I've missed out on all this for years, you know, and I started to take him out with me. And we went for little walks and went to boxing clubs. You know, I found out he was getting bullied because he wouldn't go to work. I'd done a little video of him selling me and it went viral and people rallied around and supported him, which was incredible. You know, he wouldn't even get off the couch and we got off the he got him off the couch and we walked up Snowden and raised over thirty thousand pounds for charities. You know, this is like the stuff that kept me going. So when I met this girl, Michelle, and I never in a million years thought I'd ever settle down. You know, and, and I met her and she was totally opposite from me. <laughs> she still is. <laughs> you know, you talk of me, I've got I've like I've got like a whirlwind of a life, you know. You know, it's just it's just a terrain wreck and she's like quite, you know, innocent and hasn't really been up to much and doesn't smoke, doesn't drink. Had a couple of lovely kids. Uh, and you know, we, we hit her off. And a few months later she became pregnant and I was Is it mine? <laughs> like, wow, you know you know, that this is fucking blew me away. It really did. And I was, I'll be honest, and she's going to be watching this, I know she is, but I was in two minds whether I wanted to, to stay in a relationship with someone because I couldn't really relate with myself. You know, I always sabotage them. You know, that self-sabotage is like, I thought it always, it's, 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 it's too good to be true. And when she said to me she was pregnant, I thought, you know what, right, Bill, you know, maybe this is meant to happen. Stick with it for the first time in your life. Stick with something, and it did. And we had this beautiful. We've got this beautiful baby boy, and it absolutely blew me away. And I, you know, I'm not ashamed to admit, but when I was in the hospital, it was he was a COVID kid, and he was born April twenty twenty. And um, I went in the hospital, and it was a cesarean section, C section. And when he was born, you know, I had a. Uh, I was, wow, well, I was teasing me, I was sobbing at him. And I get all emotional now thinking about it because when I look back at those, just before, you know, I decided to, to make that life-changing decision and get clean, I never thought I'd survive. I never really, and now I've got this little boy and I look at him and I think to myself, how lucky am I? to be in a position to, to nurture someone. I look at this little boy and I see myself in him and I think, you know, I wish my dad would pick me up like I picked this little boy up and hug him and tell him that he's loved. You know, and he's running around the house and he's giggling and, he, and he's happy. And, you know, for me growing up as a kid, it was, it, was, it was sad and it was scary. You know, I was locked in rooms. I was beaten on a regular basis. I was never told I was loved. And I said to myself, I'll never... You know, treat my kid, you know, the way I was treated and now and I and I don't and it's just um it's powerful, it blows me away, it does. Um yeah, wow. Well, um Yeah, and then you know, she's got these two beautiful kids, Olivia and Jamie, and um I've never heard them swear. <laughs> Not once, you know. They're quite polite. They need to clean the rooms now and then they, but Wind me up that put a towel up a flush of chain, you know. But that's luxury problems, isn't it? You know, we can, um, you know, I can wake up like, a, like oh, gee, that's not picked up, and this is there. But this is this is life, this is family life. So, this is what I've got, and this is what I've bought into, and, and I love it. And, and, and you know, I love my partner, and we've recently been engaged, which is um, which is massive. Never in a million years thought I'd get engaged, and neither did she, uh, so. Yeah. And the people have, have 
I've met on this journey, you know, in these past five years. I set up a podcast a couple of years ago, sitting across the table from from incredible people with incredible stories who became friends with. It's massive. It really is. And, you know, and I watch podcasts and, you know, and I watch people and I, and I observe people's behaviour and I think, you know what, some people are hating out there. Some people are struggling. People are hating on me and, you know, and I just wish them well. I wish them well. I don't wish them no harm. I know what it's like to be on the receiving end of me. Yeah, I do. So I don't really know if it made any sense, but I just wanted to. I want to dedicate this podcast to my brother Joe, me mum, my partner, and everyone who's been in my corner, and all the friends that have been rooting for me, and you, my audience, the people who subscribe, the people who watch this show. Thank you very much for everything you've done. All your beautiful comments. It means a lot to me. And with that, I'm going to say, see you next week. Thank you very much. Yeah, five minutes today. Anybody knew you were on another side? Yeah. <laughs> That's the way to do it. <laughs> Hey <laughs> <laughs> son, just want to say congratulations, five years clean, you don't know how much it means to me, um, I'm going to get upset now because I never thought I'd see you today, you've changed your life around and I love you to bits, congratulations. Billy Moore, congratulations mate. Five years in recovery. What an achievement. It's been a joy to watch your growth over the last few years and be a part of your life in some way since we shot a prayer before dawn. Here's to many more years. Lots of love. Hey, what's up? Dorian Yates, six times Mr. Olympia here. Just giving a shout out to my mate Billy Moore. Five years clean and sober. Congratulations, mate. Uh, biggest battle you'll ever fight are the ones inside yourself with your own demons. So congratulations, brother. Keep on walking forward. Keep on walking strong. Billy, Troy Hawk, congratulations on hitting your five years, you bugger. Shoulders back and keep at it. Hey, man. Hope you're well, fella. Look like a mess here. Just fresh out the gym. But uh, congratulations on being five years sober, lad. Kicking it dead in. Should be proud of yourself. Lots of love from the bad man. You get all this message is for Billy. I want to say a big well done on five years going clean. After the road you went down, mate, it couldn't have been easy. I'm sure it's been difficult, but you've done it and you're a great example to working class men like myself like no matter how dark the road gets you can turn around walk out of it and still be standing at the end and the work you've done in the community with weapons down gloves up and most of all for me the work you've done with your brother joe online raising awareness for autism truly you should be proud of that mate so well done keep up the good work and i'll see you soon bro what's going on bill it's obviously me your mate molly um, I just want to say a massive congratulations for what you've achieved in your whole life, but especially the last five years. It's been absolutely amazing. You watched uh, absolutely amazing watching your journey, watching you overcome all the demons and all the hardships, and just your life's coming to fruition now. You've got a lovely family, beautiful fiance, and um, I'm just so happy for you and everything. All the work you do with you with the community, with your community and with weapons down, gloves up. You're a, a real, real role model to us all, and um, still keep it real every now and then, don't you, lad? So, really, really proud of you. Not many see five years clean, so go on. Hi, hi, Billy boy, how you doing, my mate? So uh, well done, mate, everyone's proud of you. Five years! Well done, unbelievable, because I bet you was a 
fucking nightmare before that, you little fucker. But anyway, all the best, mate. Congratulations. Keep it going. I think the biggest surprise for me is that how the fuck you can watch Everton without fucking drinking. <laughs> anyway, son, proud of you. Love you loads. See you soon, mate. Keep it up. Love, Razor. Well done, Bill. Sorry, Billy, lads, you all right. Billy, just a little message, lads, just say, well done, lads, smashed it, lads. Five years, it's one of the fucking 50, lads. Lads, you smash it, lads, you're a belter, and you're an example and an inspiration to all. It's right, lads, and I love the fact that I regard it as one of my besties, lads. All the best, lads. Hey, Bill, happy five years, mate. Well done. And this is just the beginning, mate. You look at what you've done in five years, now imagine what you're going to do in 10, 15 years. Just keep going, mate. Got you back all the way. Love you lots, mate. Well done. This is a video from a very good friend, Billy Moore, who's celebrating five years in recovery. Phenomenal achievement. It's actually unbelievable, especially where Billy's came from and to what he's doing now. It's totally night and day. Many people have seen the film of Bill or read his books, The Prayer Before Dawn, like being in prisons, addicted to drugs and totally transforming his life, like... Not just in recovery, he's now got a beautiful son. He's now got a great podcast as well. He's doing massive things. He's also just released his second book. And I'm proud to call you a friend and I'm proud of everything you're achieving. And for anybody that's in the struggle or don't think there's a way out, it's guys like you, Bill, who give people hope and inspiration, including myself. But I just want to say proud of you. Congratulations. I look forward to seeing the rest of your journey, but this is only the start of it, brother, for what you've got to come. Unbelievable again, and I just want to say, proud of you again, and I love you to bits, and it goes to show what can be done if you believe in yourself and, and not quit. You were on my podcast three, four years ago. You were one of my first guests, and I was blown away by your story, and you've not stopped ever since. You've just keep raising the bar and keep believing in yourself, and it's unbelievable to see, and I'm proud of you, and you're a true inspiration. Have an amazing day, brother. Go and enjoy it, and I'll speak to you soon. Love you always, bro. Yes, I. This one's for my brother, Billy Moore. I hope you're well, mate. Congratulations on your five years clean time. You know, that's a, a miracle. That's a sign of strength and hope right there for recovering addicts. Um, remember the first day I met you, Bill, when we done that podcast? And I remember thinking, this is a good man here. You know, a really good head on your shoulders. Um, and you're one of, quite a number actually, but you're one of the best people I've got around us at the minute. And there's, I'm fortunate enough to have a few good people around us. And you're one of them, Bill. You know, you're, um, and I find that, you know, some of the best people have been some of the worst people, you know. And I hope you don't mind me saying that, brother. But um, you just keep doing what you're doing, Billy, you know. The gift of recovery, you just... They're coming your way tenfold. Congratulations, brother. Big love. Speak to you soon. Hello, Billy. Tom Aspinall here, UFC heavyweight. Just want to say, mate, massive congratulations for the five years in recovery. I'm sure everyone's very proud of you. I'm very proud of you, but most of all, you should be proud of yourself. Take it easy, mate. Billy, for me, Lee Butler, a massive congratulations on your five years. You know, it's so important that we're loud and proud about our recovery. You know, one thing when you're actively in addiction is that it feels like there's no hope, but by spreading the word and showing in your actions that there's an amazing life out there, free from drink or drugs, it gives people who are struggling with their addiction that one important thing which you feel like there isn't any of when you are actively struggling with your addiction, and that is hope. Keep spreading the hope, my mate. Well done to you. Have a brilliant day, mate. Frankie Allen, UK's most feared comedian. Billy Moore, five years sober. Great achievement, Bill. What an achievement. You deserve it. You're looking great at the moment. You're back up there. You're doing fantastic. All the very best, Bill. Take care. Quick message for Billy. I know it's uh, your five-year recovery coming up. Just want to say a massive well done, mate. Keep it up. Keep the videos going. All the content. It's really good probably aspiring to some people as well keep up the work you're doing with joe and all the best mate and here's to another five years all the best morning billy uh just a little message to say congratulations for five years clean and sober very very proud of you mate uh keep going keep smashing it keep smashing everything uh big love mate 
All right, Bill. Jamie here. Just a message to say congratulations on five years clean. It's a unbelievable story. Your story. Um, coming where you've come from. Looking at where you are now. The turnaround is just absolutely phenomenal. You know, you've uh, you're an inspiration to young kids in the city. You know, you're almost a poster boy, really, Bill. Of of for these kids and what they could do with their lives, even though these a lot of these kids nowadays th feel like they've got no other option but to go down the route to the go and well, your story is a prime example that there are other options out there and there are ways out. And, you know, I, I couldn't do this video without mentioning Joe. You know how much of a big fan of Joe I am, Bill. He's uh, seeing the videos of the series just absolutely lights up my day. You know, I've got a brother who's 10 years younger than me and... You know, I love him just as much as I love anyone in, in the world, more than I love anyone in the world. And, you know, the the bond that you've got, anyone who's got a brother will know just exactly how special that is. And, yeah, the way you put a smile on his face and the way he looks up to you is absolutely brilliant. And, Joe, keep doing your thing, mate. You're an absolute superstar. Um, and, Bill, yeah, just thanks for sharing my story as well on your podcast and, you know, the work that you're doing with the knives down, gloves up. It's superb. Keep it up, mate. And we're lucky to have you in the city. And we're lucky to call you our own. Have a great night. And I'll see you soon. Hello, Billy. Congratulations on the um, fact that you've stayed clean for five years now. He's swimming before he's even landed. Mm. <laughs> 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 you ready? He's <laughs> <laughs> already. <laughs> And again, let's go for a swim. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if this is a put him in. <laughs>